Okay, today we are going to knock out a scene using Krita and Tahoma. Quick recap where we're at. Got a bunch of shots here. Conversation between the king and Golik. Actually did some fixes on this shot uh, whereby the king was a little off character. And then the last shot I did yesterday was this one, which kind of brings us transitionally into this moment in the story where the prince and this guy that I guess you could call his caretaker <coughs> enter the courtroom and sort of interrupt the king and Golik as they are in the process of making their malevolent plans. Okay. Um... <coughs> Quick note about Tahoma. Good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is that there's a new version of Tahoma Out 1.1 official. The key feature for me that makes Tahoma 1.1 useful uh, would be the ability to do what I did right here, which was take any imagery that you're working on in Krita and just drag and drop it. Well, no, I'm sorry, not drag and drop it. Cut and paste it into Tahoma. That's the good news. The bad news is that this is in fact um, 1.0.1 not 1.1 and the reason is that when I upgraded from 1.0 to this um, <clears throat> I guess you'd call it a beta build the um, the transition to this version that allows for cutting and pasting was simply a matter of dragging the exe file, the the executable, and I don't recall if I had to drag some of the um, the DLL files that are in the root Tahoma folder. Uh, had to drag them into my existing Tahoma installation. As I recall, I may have done that, but the point is that by doing that, as opposed to using the unzipped uh, build uh, by itself. I was able to preserve my entire setup, my hotkeys, um, my rooms, these rooms, the skin. A lot about what you see here on the screen is not the way Tahoma looks when you first install it. Okay, With version 1.1 so far, and I've sent a message to Jeremy Bullock on YouTube about this, um, a simple bringing in any DLLs that are of a different, let's say, size uh, and the EXE into my existing installation does not work. Everything I've tried breaks my Tahoma installation such that the skin is different, the hotkeys are different, the rooms are different. Essentially, it's a non-starter, which is kind of a drag, but it is what it is. So for me, I can't really buy into the upgrade to 1.1 knowing that I'm going to have to spend an hour uh, reconjiggering everything and hoping that the reconjiggering, uh, you know, is more or less seamless. My other basic criticism of Tahoma um, that I do hope uh, Jeremy addresses is that for, you know, the last uh, year to two years in OpenTunes, if you press the space bar, you are invoking the zoom tool, okay? Here, what you see happening is you press the space bar, and it and the the pan tool is hard coded into Tahoma. Because I changed the hotkeys, what actually happens is I press the space bar, and then when I let up, I get my zoom tool. Um, but in in a group, you know, admittedly, this is a bit nitpicky, but uh, the problem is that I can't just press the spacebar, zoom, and then let up and then be back to my prior tool, which would have been typically the brush. So here I'm, I'm say, brushing, and I would hit the spacebar, and instead of being able to zoom, what I have to do is wiggle it a little bit and then let up with the spacebar and then zoom. Okay, again, it's nitpicky, but it also is indicative of kind of what's going on under the hood. Now, if you want to circumvent that problem, you just accept um, that Jeremy's preferred um, hotkeys for panning and zooming, which would be, let me hit the B key. Okay, so I believe that if I want to rotate the canvas, I hit space, 
uh, I hit, uh, I'm sorry, control space. If I want to zoom the canvas, I hit shift space. And that works the way it used to work. Okay. So again, it's definitely nitpicky, but you know, at the same time for two years, I've been, I've been used to being able to press the space bar and my personal opinion, not cracking on Jeremy because he's done an awesome, wonderful job with uh, his development on Tahoma. But for me, as a fellow programmer, the idea that those hotkeys are hard coded into the application and can't actually be overridden is, for me, ridiculous. That's that's just my opinion, um, and it's and it's more it's made more ridiculous by the fact that actually you can override them. I've done it. I hit the space bar, and if I wiggle a little bit, I actually do get the the tool that I've mapped to the space bar. Okay, so in point of fact. You have a bizarre tug of war um, going on between my preferences as the user, how I want it to work, versus the proclivities of the programmer to say, well, you should just get used to it working this way. Uh, that's a philosophical debate um, that I just have a, a fairly strong opinion on. Now, to be fair, if you were to go start using TV Paint, you know, which is a commercial application, good good program for animation, cost you about a thousand dollars. Those very same hotkeys are hard coded into TV Paint, and it turns out that the only, literally, the only hotkey in TV Paint that you can't customize is the hotkey you use the most often, which is the pan tool rotate of your. Uh, your workspace so again to me same criticism of tv paint to me it's comically ridiculous but and and i can assure you again as a programmer there is no technical reason why uh that restriction is necessary absolutely none so it is what it is so for me uh tahoma 1.1 is off the table for today that might change tomorrow um but I don't know. I mean, I suspect not because I did mention this to Jeremy like a month ago, and the official version of 1.1 that came out uh, wasn't changed. So it's either too much of a hassle to change it because of the way it's hard coded into the program, or he's made a philosophical decision to say, hey, if you're going to use Tahoma, you accept these hotkeys as being um, standard and you just get used to it. So again, you know, there there is an argument uh, to be made for both sides of that. And frankly, as a as a is an animator you can get used to anything so it isn't actually that big of a deal at the end of the day however that doesn't mean Tahoma's is not darn useful because it is and we're going to use it right now the reason we're going to use it is because of this in this shot uh, and by the way if you're tuning in to see all kinds of fun character animation you're going to be disappointed because this shot what happens is there's this um staff that the guard has and the way we transition into this part of the scene is that we see the staff bang twice against the f against the uh, floor as the uh, guard prepares to announce the arrival of the prince okay so let's look at some of the mechanics of how one would do that and we want to basically do it as efficiently as possible so into or in uh, Krita the the simplest way to do that and by the way of course with a shot like this especially anything that I can do in Krita where I'm cutting and pasting visual elements into Tahoma definitely could be done just as easily and arguably better directly in Tahoma. Why? Because um, mainly in Tahoma you've got your um, your smart raster levels that lets you tweak your color information after the fact so that's a good thing. Same kind of thing we have in Blender 2.0 uh, 8 plus or 2.9 which is what I've been using well actually 2.91 um, so there's no actual huge uh, strong compelling reason to be even doing this in Krita uh, but I'm gonna demonstrate the cut and paste functionality in the process so no big deal so my first step is to do an analysis okay so the first thing I'm gonna do is is analyze this uh, typically what's going to happen for a shot for me is I'm gonna change the frame rate to eight frames per second because I'm just that's the frame rate I'm operating in and now let's just think about what happens here he goes bang bang and then he says and then it cuts to another shot so this is a very short shot right 
So one one thousand. It's it's not even a second. So it's it's roughly a second of of stuff. Uh, typically, before we get into a scene, in order to make it editorially uh, a little bit more ergonomic, I will almost always give at least a half a second, and oftentimes one full second before I start any action. Okay, and that gives me a little bit of a breather for transitioning when, when we're at the edit, editing stage. And it often happens that you want that extra time to give the audience a moment to digest what's about to happen in the current shot. Now, in this case, uh, that doesn't really matter much. Why? Well, because I'm not going to do the animation in Krita. I'm literally only using Krita to create my uh, visual elements. Okay, now there is one pretty good reason to use Krita for this, which is that for painting the background, I think it's probably going to be a little easier. Um, for those of you who are big Tahoma fans, you could argue that the um, the perspective guides in Tahoma uh, would make it easier to create the floor and maybe the direct the decorations on the floor that you know there might be some tiling or something that goes on. Um, and I would say that you might be correct about that. I unfortunately haven't spent any time at all with the uh, perspective tool in Tahoma. I don't know how to use it. So for now, we're going to live without that. Okay. I've actually never, there, there's similar tools in Krita actually. And again, same thing. I've never used them. I uh, never particularly felt the need to. So what I'm going to do is I've made my background kind of uh, transparent. And then we got to think about this kind of in two ways. Number one, we're going to create the staff. Number two, we're going to um, need a copy of the staff that's semi-transparent so that we can put a reflection in the floor. So what we really want to do is uh, actually copy the animation um, with a reflected version so that they basically come together and meet each other here w at the floor right like that bam 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 so you'll see uh, not only the reflection but also a little shadow so the shadow should should kind of be like a dot that grows into something like that and then it strikes the floor and then as the staff ri rises again the shadow would again dissipate down to essentially nothing so I'm gonna hit Z a few times I use Z for undo not control Z kinda got that from well, it's not standard, but I think in GIMP from, I mean, going back years, I just got used to saying, hey, why am I going to hit Control-Z if I can hit Z? So I just use Z for um, for undo. Some people use Z for, for a zoom tool, so there's that to consider as well. But Okay, so step one, I would say in this case, is this is a pretty simple scene. So let's just let's just jump right in without even doing a pencil test. We've got the sketch that's guiding us, so let's... Let's take a an ink color that's kind of sort of what we tend to prefer for ink, which is going to be a slightly reddish or brownish tinted uh, charcoal, right? It's not typically actually black, all right? And then what I'm going to do is just... Just draw this baby like that. That's it. Okay, so now you can see a little bit of a winkiness up here, and that's just because um, my hand dragging against the screen kind of causes it to get a little off kilter. So we'll just make a little adjustment with the liquify tool that's hitting the A key. The A key, which is, for me, is mapped to the um, transform. Okay, so, and this, this actually reveals kind of a related flaw in Krita, which is that according to the pop-up here, the tooltip, if you will, the hotkey for the f um, transform tool is Control-T, when in fact it isn't, actually. I've set the hotkey to be A, and Krita doesn't seem to want to know that. It's never really affected my workflow, so frankly, I don't care. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is fill this. So I hit the F key to fill, and then what I'm going to do is go into behind mode so that it doesn't actually overlap my outlines. Okay, and boop, we just got ourselves a problem. 
what the heck just happened? Um, let's unselect. I, I'm going to just say that maybe it's just because we're getting a little bit of a leak here. So let's give that a try again. Yep, that worked. Okay. So now, um, key question would be, where is the um, light coming from? And I'm going to say that the light's coming from the upper left in this shot. Mainly because in earlier shots, the light was coming from stage right. And from the audience's perspective, we were looking in the total opposite direction. So I would just assume that the lights are coming from that direction. So how do we make this into um, something a little more dimensional without too much fussing? And my answer would be just press this little guy right here. This is preserve alpha this is kind of one of the things that keeps me working in Krita as opposed to just jumping over to Tahoma for this in Tahoma especially if I use a smart raster uh, level I would have to choose my colors delineate where the shadows or highlights are and then actually choose different colors to fill in there it's not a bad way to work it's just not my preference so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just make this a little lighter um, let's grab this brush and because of the preserve alpha we cannot quite literally cannot go outside of the lines see that which is pretty nice okay now I'm also going to I think I'll put this in overlay mode and then turn the opacity down so that so that the the change is a little more uh, let's say gentle if you will and then if I want to I can actually because my transparency is not part of the layer, rather it's part of the um, of the brush, you could use overlay mode over here and put it on another layer, but now all of a sudden you have a bunch of layers starting to stack up in a situation that really doesn't call for it, okay, you know, in my opinion. So the next thing I'll do is kind of the opposite. Let's go to black, but turn it way down here so that we can then say, well, okay, let's have a, Let's just have a shadow situation that kind of goes under like that. Okay, and then because the overlay mode is causing not only a darkening, but also a little bit of an enriching, if you will, of the saturation, I think I want to go ahead and uh, allow that additional contrast to flow through um, in the shadow area okay so and for my taste I'm gonna say let's go ahead and tighten that up a little bit like that and I think we're in good shape okay so that's that we can go back to normal mode I would say turn our opacity just kinda get everything back to normal okay so now I'm thinking that my best course of action here is going to be to just duplicate this layer and and sort of hard code the reflection into the shot okay so what do I mean by that I'm gonna hit the A key again so that I can reverse this and if you want to reverse it as surgically precisely as possible then just go down here and do a uh, a reversal that way now I'm noticing uh, I'm not seeing my other layer so I assume I'm still in isolation mode so I'm hitting the tilde key which is what I have mapped to the uh, ability to isolate a layer okay so now it probably makes more sense if the truth be known I'm gonna actually redo this and here's why if it's gonna animate down then clearly the length of this needs to be long enough to reach the floor which means if I were to animate this all of a sudden the top of it's disappeared so let's go like this let's put this down on the floor where it's gonna hit um, and then I'm gonna hit let's see is it control no it must be alt. yeah I'm gonna hit alt and just go ahead and stretch it okay now I'm gonna duplicate my paint layer flip it like so put that right there and again I'm not actually 100% sure this is gonna work but I'm gonna give it a try so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and let's call that our reflection okay 
Let's save our work. Uh, save early, save often. And now let's go ahead and try doing some cutting and pasting and see how it goes. I literally have no idea if this is going to work. We jump up to Tahoma. And then what I'm doing is in Krita in the other screen, I'm just going to hit Control A. And by the way, this is kind of an important point. I don't know about Tahoma 1.1, but in 1.0.1, if you going back to Krita here, um, one of one weakness of the implementation of cut and paste, in my opinion, is that Tahoma seems to um, make a decision that is arguably a pretty smart decision, and that decision is this: if you look at this layer and you see this layer has nothing in it except this, but yet I hit Control A, so I have a selection that represents the entire screen. Okay, well. I'm pretty sure what Tahoma's going to do is it's going to look at this image on the on the clipboard and it's going to say, well, this is just a bunch of empty, you know, empty uh, pixels. They're not being used. So why are we going to include them? And so what it will do is it will crop whatever's on the clipboard to the minimal space necessary. Now, in principle, if you're concerned about resource um, allocation, you're concerned about wasting memory and blah, 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 that sort of thing, then that might actually be a good idea. For me, I'm, I'm not, I don't love it for the simple reason that what if I want to uh, animate this here in Krita and just cut and paste the animated cells into Tahoma? The problem is that what, what's going to happen is, let's say if I took this and moved it over, Let's say, you know, not that there's any good reason to do that, but let's just say I did that. Well, the problem is it's going to crop it in that way every time. So what happens is each of the subsequent frames that you cut and paste into Homa actually wind up getting centered in the screen. And so now you're into spending time repositioning everything. So for me, um, kind of consistent with the way I feel about customizing hotkeys, my opinion is if I hit Control A and, and I'm selecting and cutting to the clipboard an image that is an entire HD frame, then I don't want the software to overrule me on that. I have reasons why I want to cut and paste the, the entire frame, and that's because I want to preserve the positioning of the drawn items that are in that frame. You could probably trick it, actually. If you wanted to trick it, the way you'd probably trick it is you take your brush and you draw some little tiny dot in the corners that forces Tahoma to recognize the fact that there's important stuff everywhere throughout this uh, frame. So it's just something to consider. Let's give it a crack here and see how it goes. So up here we're in Tahoma. I'm just going to go to another layer. I'm going to hit Control V. And as you can see, what I said would happen is precisely what did happen. Not the end of the world, but uh, again, you know, just kind of not my preference, right? So I'm going to hit the A key here in Tahoma to activate the animate tool. And right here on frame one, we're just going to put this kind of sort of where it belongs. Now, the zillion dollar question is going to be, how is the semi-transparent imagery going to transfer over? Okay, so we go back to Krita. Here's our copy. And because it's in isolation mode right now, it's soloed, if you will, to use the musical term parlance. I'm going to unsolo it, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take... Uh, let me check something here. Okay, so this is unfortunate. This is actually Krita behaving inconsistently. There are, there are a litany of situations where if I take um, an image that uh, extends outside of the drawing zone where that pixel data will be preserved and in the vast majority of instances what I've always found is that's exactly what happens. This happens to be the bizarre exception. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Krita decided, nope, we're going to actually um, delete those unneeded pixels. So now I have to do the whole thing over again. <laughs> so let's duplicate it. Let's flip it. We gotta we gotta grab it first. Let's flip it, and you could argue that we're gonna want all those those pixels, and we know it's gonna get centered by Tahoma anyway. So let's just do this. Let's just make it semi-transparent, like we did before, about like that, I'd say. And now we'll just hit Control C and see what happens. All right. So now we come up here. 
and we hit control V and unfortunately it turns out that uh, the clipboard could be Tahoma's fault could be Krita's fault hard to say but it turns out that the clipboard does not respect opacity so one thing we want to consider here is that the uh, reflection should be under the main part of the drawing and now we have to figure out well okay how are we going to make this semi-transparent um, there really isn't a good way uh, if we were using a smart raster level, here's what our trade-off would be. If you wanted to get all these different gradations of tone in a smart raster level, you would have to have palette entries for every single one of these itsy bitsy colors. That's why I drew it in Krita. Um, and now to be to to note one thing about um, Tahoma is if you're drawing in a standard raster level where you have what we have here which is just a just a grid of pixels it's it's just a bunch of pixels there's no smart color data in it okay one of the th one of the advantages of that is that if you use the um my paint brushes you can also use let's hit the b key you can also use this little feature here lock alpha which is the same thing we did in Krita in my experience though it doesn't work anywhere near as well because what happens is you pretty much have to have your opacity um, I don't want to demonstrate it here but the bottom line is you, when you turn the opacity down it doesn't just nicely paint on with you know sort of the opacity applied to what you're doing as the last step in sort of the programmatic pipeline what it actually does is it affects the transparency of the color you're applying and it doesn't you, you try it yourself and you'll see what I mean it just doesn't work quite as well okay so the question is how do we make this transparent well here's what we do we hit the F3 key and when you in this actually came up in a recent question someone asked me about um, a compositor what's somebody said in a comment they said well what's a good compositor to use along with open tunes or Tahoma and I said um, the answer is open tunes or Tahoma because I think what this particular um, viewer did not realize is that there's a an extremely capable extremely powerful um, node based compositor built right into uh, Tahoma so you hit uh, and it's called the schematic now you've got two schematics in Tahoma. This is the stage schematic which basically reflects what's going on over here in the X sheet. You've got each of these levels, they pipe into the quote unquote table and whatever comes out here is what winds up getting rendered. Okay, but if you click this little button right here, now you're looking at what's called the effects schematic and this is essentially again a node based compositor. So what does that mean? That means that if I wanted to do color correction on any of these levels, I could just right mouse click and insert an effect. And now look at this. All of these different effects are available to you for creating all kinds of visual elements, um, affecting the way it renders, uh, or blending layers together. So actually quite powerful what we want to do is we want to take this level which is column three and we want to just crank down the opacity of it typically when I'm doing that I'm gonna go to image adjust and let me see here I think adjust levels probably will do the trick now if we double click that we see here that we get all the options related to a level adjustment so we can color correct it and everything else all I want to do is take the alpha output turn it down uh, kind of similar to what we did in Krita, I guess it would be about 20%, which this goes up to 255, which really does make sense because those are the actual potential um, pixel values. Uh, it's it's a, a eight bit number, so it can go from zero to 255. So we'll just kind of smack it right about there. So this is the alpha output, in other words, the transparency output we're taking the maximum transparency and cranking it down okay so that's that and now if it looks the same but if you go into the rendered mode um, you can see that it's not the same now what you can also see is that I screwed up I did it to the wrong uh, level I wasn't thinking well that's easy to fix 
We'll just jump back here. Whoops. And we're going to take this and we're going to smack this into there. And by the way, you don't want this situation because then what you'll get is you'll get the transparent one actually mixed with the uh, opaque one. And sometimes there are situations where that's useful, but not here. So we're going to take this, pipe it into there. And as you can see, like I said, it's, it's your traditional node-based compositing. Works great. Okay, uh, the only caveat I would say here is that the alpha is probably a little bit too low. But happily, we can actually crank the level up a bit and see it update in real time, just like we would expect. The downside to looking at everything in what uh, Tahoma calls preview mode is that um, it does slow down your playback and whatnot because uh, Tahoma is calculating all of those post-production effects. So if you want to simulate that in your um, faster performing X-sheet viewport, blah, 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 just turn down the opacity of the layer. So importantly, there is absolutely no relationship between this level opacity that you see in the viewport and what renders. If you want it to render with some transparency, you've got to add that post-production effect. Looks to me like I got them matched up pretty closely. And so what you see here is that the, um, the uh, real-time uh, interface uh, can be made to look pretty much the same as what you're going to get at render. So that's that. And now we need to deal with the floor. So we'll jump back to Krita. All right, now for our purposes, I would say we no longer need our background. So boom, we're just going to kill it. Uh, I would also say we no longer need our reflection. So boop, we're just going to kill it. <coughs> kill, kill, kill. Now what do we do? Well, um, I don't actually like Krita. I need to change that preference. I don't. I don't generally prefer for it to show me the selection mask as a layer, but that's a whole discussion for another day. So now what I'm going to do is actually uh, let's go look at our. Let's actually jump back up here and go to our timeline, and I want to look back a bit and see if maybe one of these earlier shots could be used for what we're doing here. Okay, I see. We've actually got a floor that's... Ah, you know what? I think actually this shot might do the trick. That might do the trick quite well. Now, we had another one way back here from the past. We're going to definitely be using this shot again. We're probably going to reverse it, by the way. A couple shots from now, we're going to use this background again. Um... But let's look at the let's look at the floor situation. Yeah, I think so. Let's go back and use this one um, right here. Okay, so where are we getting that from? Well, that shot that's zero thirty nine, and so now what we need to do is go into probably the render folder for thirty nine and see what we've got. Okay, and what we have is the render, and frankly, we could probably use just about any of these images. So, um, I don't think we really even need to do this in Krita, actually. There's no reason to. Let's just drag the correct image into Tahoma. Let me double check here and make sure I'm on the right. Yeah, wanted to make sure that you guys are seeing the correct screen. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the image and just drag it in here. Now, this is important. Okay, this is very good. It gives you the choice to either import or load. If you do load, what it's going to do is it's going to bring in this image from its current location and any changes you make to it will be changed when you save to the image in its original location. Now in this case, that's a pretty dangerous thing to do because that image is one of the rendered frames that's used in an earlier shot. So if I were to change it here, I might be hosing myself by, by having changes propagate back to an earlier shot that I forget about. Okay, therefore it's better to hit import and what Tahoma is doing in, a, in effect here is it has now made a copy 
of that image and it has dragged it into its own folders. So now you might ask, well, what folders? Where? What are we talking about here? And the answer is right here, extras. Okay. So if you have a, a Open Tunes or Tahoma project, you might wonder, and, and if you could probably work in these, these applications for quite some time without knowing where it's actually storing anything. The basic answer you want to be aware of is the following. And you're not going to see everything exactly correctly here because this is an image browser that only shows images and the OpenTunes file formats are not perceived by it as images. So when you create a scene in Tahoma that's a smart raster level, that level gets put in the drawings folder. Typically what happens is that your scene, your Tahoma scene, your TNZ file will be stored here in the scenes folder. Your TLV levels or your smart raster levels will get stored in the drawings folder. And within the drawings folder, it will create a new folder that has the same name as your scene. Okay. Now in this case, I have not yet saved the scene. So Tahoma's not really going to know what to do with it from the standpoint of um, uh, where you know what file uh, folder name to to give it. But remember, what we're dealing with right here is not a smart raster level. We're dealing with a dumb raster level or a standard raster level. We're just dealing with images. So those are not stored in the drawings folder. They are stored in the extras folder. And so now. Well, we see uh, something very, very interesting that I also find a bit disturbing, but a bit unsurprising. Which is, <laughs> it turns out that Tahoma thought what we wanted to do was import the entire image sequence. So let me look at something here. Yes, and that's precisely what it did. That's not what we meant to do. So it's good, though, that it's smart enough to recognize an image sequence and and treat it as an image sequence so I'm not going to complain about that okay so there's the image and now what we can do is go back here we know that this is the one we used so what we can do is actually delete all the rest of these out of our extras folder we don't need them whether that's going to cause Tahoma to get confused and maybe crash or something we will find out okay so this would probably be a good time to save our scene this is 184 dash so I'm going to go ahead and save this uh, and we'll do save all and as you can see like I said it's going to save it in the scenes file you, or folder you can override that you can put the scenes wherever you want but in my experience it does turn out to be typically easier to just let Tahoma put them where it wants to because then all your scenes wind up in the same place so 184b bam Okay, so now we are essentially ready to just kind of get to work in Tahoma. And the first step we're going to want to take is to scale this background image so it actually kind of sort of makes sense. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click this little guy right here, which crops our environment to the... Um, crops our environment to the camera view so we can actually see what we're doing. Um, it looks like the looks like that backfired because as you can see this is something I didn't realize was gonna happen is that oh wait I'm, I'm wrong I was gonna say that the control widget for the animation tool disappeared but actually it didn't so okay cool so I'm gonna shrink this back down a bit and what we're looking for is and obviously by the way we're gonna have to scale this um, this image so that it bleeds off the page properly. So let's go ahead and just make some adjustments. Um, I really want to make sure that these guys are both adjusted exactly the same way. That's going to be a little tricky. But what we can do is we can move the center to here and then grab this uh, level and drag its center to essentially the same point. Now, how does that help us? Well, it means that when we do a scale operation, it's going to scale from here, 
which means the size will expand out from uh, from that center point. So what I'm doing is on the widget, I'm grabbing this this little guy right here for scale. If you grab this one, it's going to scale uh, horizontally and vertically, which is very useful, by the way, for squash and stretch. If you want to do squash and stretch animation without necessarily resorting to the plastic tool, you know, and deformations. Um, the scale tool is actually quite capable, uh, especially if your characters broke up into pieces like a puppet. Okay, so what I need to do is just get this so that it flows off the screen. And let's go ahead and go back to this view. We want it to flow off the screen far enough that we're going to be able to uh, lift it up and down. I guess we just need to get it off the screen because at that point... Um, it's going to go up and down from here so that so we we've, we've got it large enough so now we can grab this guy and do the same thing so that they basically just kind of sort of match there you go that's all you need okay so now for me i do tend to prefer working in this view so what's going to happen here i'm going to make a slight adjustment on this as well uh looks like that may call for being uh enlarged just a little bit and for me, something like that feels about right. So you sort of can tell there's the doorway there, and but you can't see the soldier. Okay. In a moment here, by the way, we're going to add a um, uh, the shadow as well. Now, one thing I'll point out is that right now uh this is why I, m I made mention of potentially inviting a crash when i deleted those images why do i say that well if you notice here in my level strip i can still see all those images but they don't actually exist on disk anymore so probably what's going to happen is if i grab this and by the way again i'm going to save save all save everything could be let me see the order in which i did things might actually matter here nope we only have the images uh the ones i deleted are didn't like reappear or something um i can imagine a scenario where that could happen but anyway so i suspect when i click this right here what's going to happen is i'm going to see nothing on the screen okay didn't do it with that one but all the other ones it did so whether we've again invited some memory management problems or something because Tahoma thinks that these images are still part of the project when in fact they're not I have no idea I don't know if we're gonna get some kind of crash because of that or or what but anywho let's go back to our um, X sheet and okay interesting uh, you know do you call that a bug or a feature if you are in your level strip and then you go click on the X sheet it doesn't actually go to the X sheet here you have to click in the level itself eh, okay that's how it works we can live with it alright so what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna let Tahoma do the hard work of interpolating the animation so let's stretch this out to 32 frames by the way our frame rates wrong so let's go to our camera settings not our scene settings up oh, I was wrong sorry back pedal I meant scene settings scene settings we want the frame rate to be 8 boom okay alright so now what we need to do is we're gonna basically have a pause and then we're going to have the stick go up and down twice so that means I'm gonna click on this little keyframe right here which only exists because I use the animate tool okay so I'm gonna grab that you can see it's centered where it's supposed to be because I actually moved it into position to home a set a an animation keyframe right there so I'm gonna hit control C and I'm gonna go forward one second and hit control V now what that does is it makes it so that there's no interpolation between here and here the stick will just stay where it is and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say we probably wanna go uh, about a quarter of a second so a quarter of a second to to make this movement I'm thinking we can go shift drag okay and now we can do the same thing we did before hit control C control V to put that back 
and so then we get exactly what we wanted boom boom okay so now we're going to just duplicate those keys so I hit control C go here control V and now we're going to get exactly what we wanted boom boom okay so now we just have to echo that motion in the reflection right so control C control V and then right here uh, is the key we're gonna hit the animate tool again hitting shift to constrain it to the axis kinda move it down there it doesn't have to be exact control C control V and then here we wanna um, end up back where we started so control C here control D here okay so our shots actually almost done uh, in fact I'm actually gonna say our shot is done I, I don't think putting the since the reflection is so uh, compelling I don't think we need the um, I don't think we need the shadow in there so I think I think our shot is done so hopefully you found that useful um, in terms of working with Krita and Tahoma together and uh, we'll move on to probably a little bit more fun shot that actually involves some characters here in the next one. And until then, as you guys know, there will be more later.